welcome to Conveyancing Matters with Lorraine and Stu. Join us for a chat about all things property. Well, hello, hello. Hello, Stu. Hello, Peter. How you doing? You're right. Yeah. Very well. Hi, Peter. Well, we're really delighted to welcome Peter Ambrose to uh, Conveyancing Matters to our chat. Um, Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I, re I gen generally hate the phrase thought leader because it usually is about, it's usually ascribed to people that lead nothing and have no thoughts. But I have to say uh, you are a, a marvellous exception to that rule um, because obviously you've set up uh, the partnership property solicitors, you've got a background in IT. Uh, and of course, one of the big reasons we're really interested to talk to you, Peter, is uh, the digital signatures. But I wonder perhaps for the benefit of our audience whether you'd give us a sort of short potted history just about uh, your lovely self and the firm and, and, and kind of what brought you to where you are today. Well, well thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you today. Yeah, um, I mean, my background, I spent 20 years in technology, um, software side of things, both here in the States, um, in Europe as well. Um, selling software is not as glamorous as people think it is. Uh, a lot of people say, wow, it must be so exciting. It's actually quite frustrating and um, you're generally um, selling a dream that never gets realized. Which, <laughs> so after that, that I'm like, yeah, forget that. Um, saw an opportunity with the Legal Services Act that was due to come in at that time in 2010. Um, this was back in the mid 2000s to set up a business. I wanted to set up a law firm that was based on service. So at that time, of course, you couldn't do that as a non-lawyer, but we managed to form a, a company to do home information packs at the start. So we started that in 2007. We saw that as a beachhead strategy whereby we would do home information packs and on the back of that, we would launch a law firm. We worked out a way that I could employ a solicitor and then get them cross-qualified as a licensed conveyancer, so therefore I could get a license. So we were one of the first people to do this. Um, obviously by that time, the Legal Services Act was put back to 2011, um, but we managed to get our license in 2009, which was good news. Um, and we really went from there and organically, we grew the business based on using technology in a smart way, uh, but still providing really, really good law. And that was the key. And we grew that from one person to 75 people that we've got today with two offices. Uh, we focus purely on London and the Southeast market. And uh, the goal being we're trying to raise standards without getting too pious about it. Um, we've been shocked by the service level standards that we see in this industry. i say coming from technology where it was a pure meritocracy. You, there was no such thing as a gender pay gap. I had no idea such thing existed. Um, to take those ideas into the legal sphere. And, uh, and it's going okay. Oh, good. Well, that, um, as I say, there's just so many interesting threads there already, Peter. But, um, I mean, I'm interested to know, how did you, particularly back in sort of 07, 08, 09, um, I mean, Stu and I have talked on Conveyancing Matters before about, you know, prop tech, uh, mm. which we'll perhaps touch on in a minute. But, uh, you know, how did you envisage at that time in the sort of mid to late 2000s technology sort of improving the conveyancing process? Everybody's frankly on that bandwagon now yeah. uh, with varying degrees of success, I might say. But but what what was it that you did that was demonstrably different at that point? Uh, I started off, I mean, interestingly, when we when we started off doing the work, which was in 2009, that was based on three years experience of doing home information packs. Yeah. And the first thing we did was when I was setting up the company was we went to see very big estate agent, Stratton Parker, and we said, what do you need to do to solve this problem of getting documentation to clients up front? And they said, well, firstly, we need to integrate it with our case management, with our, um, our CRM system, Reaper, um, and also we need access to that information at all times. So the first thing we did was we put it in the cloud. So that was the key, because we knew that if we held data in the cloud, then anyone would be able to access it. And that was the absolute key. And that was what I knew was going to be the, um, the, the way going forward. Integration, cloud-based technologies. And, um, and that would open up uh, the, the idea that uh, people could track what was going on. Again, with our home information packs, we had a, a case tracker so that people could see the different pro progress of how the things were being put together. So again, transparency, and that was the, uh, that was the watchword. It wasn't about automation, um, and to this day, I disagree with automation. Um, I'd worked uh, running service desks for many, many years, and say both here in the States, and the one thing we know about automation is it forces people to, uh, it dumbs down people, stops them thinking, and it means that they end up making more mistakes. So um, that was really, really important, that we would never go down the workflow automation route. 
That's interesting. Fantastic. Something close to your heart, Stu, I think. Yeah, I think so. it's a really good point that, and it's, it's a, you've expressed it perfectly. You know, we don't talk about automation much, do we? We talk about technology and the way it's going to help us. But I completely agree with you. You know, we carry out, you know, legal due diligence. It's not a, a service that's, that can be automated. You know, every transaction that we act on is completely different, isn't it? So it's a great way of putting it. Automation is definitely a no-no. Well, and plus the fact, actually, at the end of the day, by and large, I still, and I'm, pre and I'm old now, officially, but I still think that conveyancing is still a people business. You know, why, why do we all, why are we all under so much pressure right now, uh, uh, you know, to take the calls, take the calls, take the calls? That's because the clients still want to communicate with us. They might want to communicate with us in a different way. But they still want that interaction. They still want that communication. And your point, Peter, about um, you know upskilling, not downskilling, is um, they they still want to know, you know, the right thing from the right person. It, it is true. But I think the mistake that people are making is that um, that thinking that lawyers have to do things the same way as they've always done them. Mm. And this is where people are making a mistake. Um, I believe one hundred percent, and and I not even ninety nine percent, a hundred percent that uh, the vast majority of what lawyers are doing today could be done better by machines. Absolutely. The one thing that can't be done better is the communication side of things. Mm. So, and I know that because we've got a portal in place and, um, and people say, oh yes, I love your portal, it's fantastic and all that, but I really need to speak to someone. So, um, you, but, but um, certainly a lot of what lawyers are doing today, and this is, as I say, we've, we've done a lot of this work now, um, is they are looking at uh, data, they're interpreting it, they're applying it to new types of uh, uh, transactions, new types of deals. But uh, all of it is exactly the same from learned experience and applying it to a set of facts, to a new set of facts. And that is what, that is what technology will do. Um, Stuart mentioned earlier that, um, you know, what's the future, you know, what's going on, what, where are lawyers going to be? Um, a lot of what lawyers are doing today will be done by technology. The problem that we've got is that there are very few people with enough imagination um, to be able to go, but what can I take away from the lawyers? What is it that lawyers are doing today that they really shouldn't be doing? And, um, and this is where I get really irritated because people say about technology and when my, my theory is, is that when people talk about tech and I get a lot of people going online and trolling and all this kind of wonderful stuff, what they think about is they think about mail merge and, um, and mail merge really was done in the nineties. And, um, and that's what they're thinking about. And it's not technology is about interpreting data and no one's even thinking about that. Well, and that probably explains Peter, why, you know, uh, your, uh, your firm was the, the first to, uh, to use a digital signature. So yeah. let's have a, let's explore that a bit if we may. Yeah. Um, because as we know, um, back in mid July, sort of mid, you know, depth of the pandemic, the land registry snuck out via a blog, which I did think was a bit of a, yeah. a bit of an odd way of doing it, really. <laughs> um, I have to say, but potentially one of the most sort of seismic shifts yeah. in, you know, deed signature in the last two hundred and fifty years. Yeah. Yeah. To, you know, to wang it out on a blog on the internet. <laughs> But, uh, but this idea of, uh, of digital signatures, the idea that we didn't need a wet signature on a deed, and we are specifically talking about a deed here, so it's typically a transfer or a mortgage deed rather than a contract, um, and the idea that it would be um, uh, signed and witnessed electronically yeah. would be permissible. So, Peter, could you just, um, and then when you've, you know, when, when you've talked us through that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hand over to Stu, can you just talk us through briefly um, what you know? What led you to decide that you know you'd be the first to do it? Were you going that direction anyway? Um, you know, tell us a bit about that. Sure. Um, we are. We really worry about fraud. Um, and we had a fraud case about four years ago where someone uh, hacked one of our clients' accounts, uh, took one of our forms, stole the client's signature, put it on there and emailed it back to us with their new bank details on it. So we're pretty good at checking this stuff, okay? Uh, we had that and our client lost 330,000 pounds, okay? We've seen this firsthand. And ever since that day, I've realized that signatures are a bunch of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And anyone that says that wet signatures are proof of identity, um, they need to stop doing convincing right now. Um, so we knew that this was an issue um, and we knew that digital signatures were considerably better. They're not a panacea, but they're considerably better. 
The other problem that we found, which was, um, which was actually because of the pandemic, was that we, we don't use email with clients, obviously since then, because <laughs> we realize they lose money. Um, we were sending documents to our clients through portal, through our portal, and we didn't realize that one of the problems that people had was that they would print all their documents at work. We had no idea. We just thought people would print them out at home and sign them and all the kind of stuff. And suddenly people were saying to us in May or June, well, I can't print this. This is really annoying. And we're like, ah, okay, this is tricky. So we knew that we had to go down the electronic forms route. We had to go down the electronic signatures route. A, it was the right thing to do, but B, actually, we didn't have a choice now because people didn't have printers. So when we saw that blog or whatever it was from um, Land Register, and you're right, it was just snuck out. And we were like, actually, this is a really big deal because what it means is for the first time, we can go end to end from start to finish with no paper. And we knew that was the future. Um, and so we thought we had to do that. And at the same time, our supplier, our search provider, they, were, they wanted to do this as well. And we said, absolutely, this is, this is the future. It has to be this way. This wasn't a, oh, this is a nice to have. This is the future. It will happen. Those people that think that, um, oh, no, you know, it won't catch on or whatever, it absolutely will. And uh, we wanted to be first. So we did some work uh, with our provider. It took, um, it took us two days to get it working, but, and that was the key. The key to get it working was that our, it was our philosophy about integration and cloud-based technology so that we could hook up a direct connection and um, literally it was on the Monday when it, I think it was Monday it came out, uh, Monday evening actually, it was when I took a phone call from our provider and we said, okay, let's get this working. And on Wednesday, we were literally at a client site uh, at their house uh, with a mobile phone uh, doing it. Wow. Stu. Yeah, it was good. It sounds great. So out of interest then, you know, this is going out to a lot of lawyers that will be watching. So yeah. you've just explained the circumstances by which is, you know, you've led you to this point. But so what documents, um, is it all the documents you send into the client? This Could it be, for example, the transfer, I assume? Uh, well, what contract? We did, I mean, interestingly, a year ago, we did an electronic uh, signature. We did the first electronic contract. So we did that. We did that a year ago, whereby we had the signed contract. Again, it's <laughs> the thing about this stuff, everyone goes, oh, it's amazingly different and all that kind of stuff. Is actually, this technology has been around for decades. And so it was literally sticking DocuSign on, on a, a happens to be a legal contract. With this one, it was purely just the transfer. Yeah. And what was interesting about it was that um, we, there was a little glitch in it in that we, first of all, the, the, it had to be witnessed. So I witnessed it when I was there. So it went, to the, um, it went to the client, first of all, who signed it. And then there's a workflow that put it back to me. I signed it. And then it was frozen. Okay, so the document was then frozen because it had both our signatures. Well, of course, what we realized was, was they froze it without the date on it. So we had to do it again, which was, we, we didn't publicize it, which was very annoying. Because <laughs> we were like, yeah, we've got to put the date in. And it, acted, and it was neither of us that had to put the date in. Obviously, it had to be the lawyer. So it had to yep. come back. So that was the challenge there. So, but that's been fixed now. But again, for something in two days, we'll, um, but that was, what was interesting about that was that the provider was like, here's the workflow. This is how it works. But then, of course, the lawyers went, well, hang on a minute. We've got to put the date on it. And I think that was a really good lesson whereby, and this is where technology should be, that's the way it should be done, whereby you get the technology provider that says, this is how you can do it. And then the lawyer goes, oh, no, no, but you've forgotten about X, Y, Z. And yeah. that's what, exactly what happened to us. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting, because I mean, not to go down this conversation, particularly Peter, but you know, Stu and I did a conveyancing matters chat a while ago about prop tech. And the yeah. fact that people come up with solutions that we don't, you know, for problems we don't have, um, added to the fact that quite often, as we were saying, have you just passed out with the excitement, Peter? Sorry, no, I'm just reaching out my heat. It was very hot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the fact that very often, you know, we, we, and I, I applaud anybody for having to go putting together something new, don't get me wrong, but um, they often put this stuff together without the, inter, you know, the intervention and interaction with the lawyers and then present something that none of us want. But with the, um, with the digital signature, Peter, it was the transfer. So you were acting for the seller because one of the land registration requirements at the moment is that the, or, or was it a transfer of equity? No, buy. no we were buying. We were oh, buying. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you got, how did that work then? So you'd got the transfer signed by the seller already on you were just putting your no, own? No, this was just our part. This was, this was just our part. Okay. So just, yeah, this was just ours. Yeah, literally it was just ours. So there wasn't... We're not, one of the problems that we've got, of course, is that we would need the other side to go, yeah, that's fine. That was the point I was going to make. Yeah. Um, therein <laughs> lies the, there, there is the problem. <laughs> um, one of the problems that we've got and why we, we're sort of taking baby steps with this stuff, and it's like everything, all right, 
it, it's like those people that put these case management systems in place with all tracking communication. They go, it's amazing because everybody can talk to one another. Yeah, that's great, but that relies on everyone else using it. I always say it's like I'm the first telephone. Great, I've invented the telephone, but I've got no one to speak to. Yeah. Um, so, and this is the problem. So, of course, um, yeah, we, um, we're nowhere near there yet. And that's, that's the issue. Um, you know, you've got to have all parties currently using the same system. Now, the good news is we use DocuSign. So if you're going to look at a standard, maybe DocuSign is out there. I think obviously it's the market leader, but the problem is, is you need everyone to buy into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the point. And that's the problem. That's yeah. That's something we've talked about before, isn't it? Yeah. And, and that was the problem. No, it was literally just us. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's interesting because do, do you think there would be a circumstance where, for example, um, you know, DocuSign is used on the protocol forms. We send them over to a buyer's lawyer. Could there be an objection? They're not being signed properly. We oh, know yeah. how this industry is so sort of adverse to change, isn't it? Uh, that's the sort of thing that would always worry me. And I suppose to me, you know, we would have a similar philosophy in that, we, you know, we want to embrace technology. But the worry is always that whatever we do, we've always got one hand time behind our back because we've got to rely on the other lawyer on no. the other side of things to play ball as well. And that is the fundamental problem. I, I tell you what we did, which I, we looked at this. I mean, for example, our like protocol forms. So I asked the question, um, this was about two months ago, um, who cares who signs the protocol forms? Yeah. Okay, and this was a serious question because everyone goes, oh, they've got to have a signature on your protocol forms. And I said, why? And my colleagues looked at me and went, well, that's a really good point because it's in communication with us to the other side. Therefore, they can rely on us. Therefore, we can, they can come after us. So actually, in fact, we went to the regulator in the end and we said, this was about client care letters, about signing client care letters because we get them all signed. And we said to our regulator, um, if it's through a portal where they've, have a, they've had a sign in, okay, and I can track them with all their IP, surely any document I can then prove it goes back to that person. And the regulator was like, yeah, and this is the CLC who we work with. Yeah. They said, um, absolutely, it is, because you, as long as you can verify who it is. So then we started thinking, well, why do we get people to sign anything? Because if we can show that they've, got, they've gone into a secure area and it has to be them and we know who they are, why sign anything? So what we did is we changed our protocol forms so that now we have this script-like signature, okay, where they just type it in. And I'm like, my way was exactly the same as yours, Joe. I was like, I'm going to get someone on the other side saying, this isn't a real signature, I don't accept it. But you know what our attitude was? Let's see what happens. So far, <laughs> no one's said anything. So like, okay. the, the, the theory must be that once we pass information from a seller's lawyer to a buyer's lawyer, it's, it's been represented, isn't it? Exactly. So then surely it's subject to misrepresentation if there's a, a portrait exactly. in there. So then so why you, sign it? Right. As I say, this was, like, and we have a lot of these moments where we look at it and we go, hang on, you've got to be thinking, you can't just look at stuff and go, well, we've got wet signatures because you can rely on it. Ask my client that lost 330,000 pounds whether relying on a wet signature is a good idea. And this is my argument for electronic signatures just because you've got something today that people have always used doesn't stop fraud doesn't stop misread and that, peter if part of the argument and i'm you know and i'm i'm in the risk averse and probably pretty reactionary corner um uh you know not that i'm averse to technology of course i'm not but i i think i'm just one of those people that takes a bit of convincing but kind of this idea of trying to sort of bring the profession with us um because of course if i'm getting a um you know, a document with just a, you know, an electronic signature, a PIF, for example, um, you know, I don't know as the receiving lawyer that it's, that it's gone through your portal. I don't know you've checked it. I don't know, I don't know the, the sort of surrounding circumstances of, of how that document has been produced. So if, you know, would it not help the process? I mean, okay, perhaps it won't because people haven't objected, Peter, but wouldn't it help if there was something in your covering email or something on the document itself to confirm that you know this has been produced through the partnership properties portal so if you've got that objection um it, it, it kind of is it's it's a bit of a it's validation for the skeptic on the other side possibly um my, my only thought on this is that surely if when we receive communications from anyone outside this firm from another law firm our view is very much we can rely on that. Mm. So you could, you could always argue, what's the difference between the information on the protocol form? We raise an inquiry 
and inquiries answered by that law firm, that's not ever signed by the client, is it? So what's the difference? You could yeah. put that point across, couldn't you? Yeah, and, and this is the point. I, I think that um, we have to look at genuine risk. It's, and this is the problem that we have is when we look at perceived risk, because risk is everywhere. Uh, you look at perceived risk versus genuine risk. Uh, and, and every communication that we have between, between ourselves and other lawyers, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I'm starting to look more and more. And also when you look at the, the cases, uh, where people are being sued. But like I would say, one of my questions is, how many people have ever been sued for lying on a piff? How many people? How often does this happen? What's the real risk? And you think, actually, it's quite slim. I mean, I, I think we've had some people like to do with fridges. Yeah. <laughs> um, you well, know. actually, Peter, because you've hit on the big one there. So for the, um, for the digital signature sceptics out there, the issue yeah. is clearly one of risk and i absolutely accept the point about perceived risk and actually we had sean spalding on here a few couple of weeks ago and he was great because he was very evangelical about the sort of the, you know the it in its general sense and this idea of really being very granular about risk and being very sensible about risk actually and he was uh, he was a breath of fresh air he was great yeah um, and, and similarly yourself so to help firms how you know, and clearly the risk around digital signatures is this sort of idea about hacking, you know, uh, you know, hacking into the cloud, da, 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 you know, that sort of electronic fraud, cyber fraud, if you like. So how do you as an organization sort of assess that risk? How do you reach the conclusion that that's an acceptable level of risk and sending a transfer to, you know, to Mr. Bloggs in Guildford and getting him to sign it and not see him isn't? Or is less, you know, it's really difficult. Um, I mean, we look at um, that's a really that's a really good question because I think what you have to do is you have to take a pragmatic view, mm. and you've got to look. You have to, and people don't do this enough. You have to look commercially to say, okay, what is the potential problem? Where could this cost? What could this cost? And who would pay the price for this? Yeah, if this goes wrong. Um, I mean, our, the way we hold data, I, I think, to me, uh, there's risk to the business and there's risk to our clients. Um, so, for example, hacking, for me, um, I am much more scared of ransomware than I am of anything else. Yeah. Anything else. Why am I scared of it? Because what it will do is it will block everything up here, and then my clients will then say, you were negligent, you didn't take the proper precautions to make sure you were safe. OK, to me, my number one fear is ransomware. Mm. OK, um, hacking people, stealing my client's data. That's also really worrying. Why? Because at some point a client will turn around and say, you didn't follow data protection rules. You didn't protect this properly. I'm, start, I'm already two steps in. All right. If I start looking at the fact was, oh, I didn't spot that the, 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 the flat was demised correctly. OK, well, that's, some, that's quite far down the list right now. Because I'll tell you something, the way I look at it, we spoke to our insurance company and we said, where are your biggest areas of claim? Where's the number one claim area and the cost for insurance companies right now is fraud. Mm. That's the number one thing. It's deposit fraud, man in the middle fraud, stealing of funds. OK, so, for example, um, the whole idea that people are using email with their clients is frankly shocking. Yeah, because we know, and we've had first-hand experience of it, we know that fraud comes through emails. It's the, we always call it the criminal's friend. Um, and, and so I'm looking at that and I'm going, right, I'm much more worried about my client going, forget the, oh, you know, the, we didn't get that indemnity policy sorted out for 200 quid you owe me. These are the guys that are sitting there going, it's 50,000 pounds claim yeah, yeah. for fraud. So actually, legal risk for us right now, it's sort of going way down the agenda. Because what we're doing more and more, and I think maybe this is a change for law firms, is we're becoming custodians of data. Yeah, yeah. We should be looking at risk to the, to the data being compromised rather than making a mess up on some legal issue. Because when all's said and done, if I have a claim for, I don't know, for £3,000, I'm just going to pay that. Okay? Because my excess is way above that. So I'm sitting there going, well, and we've got a pretty good claims record, yeah? But I'm like... Oh, well, it's really annoying. We had one the other day where it was a stupid mistake. We did about six years ago. Really stupid. Things weren't as tight there. Okay. And, it, and I think the claim came out about two, two thousand pounds. And we're like, oh, two thousand pounds. That's annoying. I'm like, I'll pay that. I'll pay yeah. that. Rather than the fact that someone coming after me and saying, you've lost your deposit for fifty thousand pounds or so, for a GDPR breach. You know, I mean, God, we get this. The amount of GDPR breaches going on at the moment. Oh, my God. 
Yeah. I mean, we're getting so many contracts from lawyers from the other side, signed contracts, okay, of nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. Three or four a day, signed contracts. Why? Because someone's working remotely and they're sending the wrong contract. Now, do we make a big deal of it? Absolutely not. Do other lawyers? Yeah, they do, and it hacks me off, frankly, all right? Don't get cute with me about some, some so-called perceived GDPR breach when it's confidential anyway. But, yeah, well, that's also the thing. I've never quite, quite, never quite understood that. In this, yeah, yeah. You know, we've, we've always been, we've always had to be bothered about confidentiality. I know, I know. You know, bloody emails to twenty people. <laughs> but well, that's another classic. I mean, I've been locum in Peter this week. Da 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 da. The no, I can tell you just in a really short space of time, the number of emails I've seen from solicitors and lawyers on the other side who I accept are under extreme pressure, who just forward what their client sends to them. So I've now got their client's details, yeah, I've got yeah, their client's yeah. email address. To me, in my old fashioned way, that is a flagrant breach of confidentiality, whichever way you look at it. And this um, is, and that's, extraordinary. And this I'm is, imagine you're seeing it a lot, Stu. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And we were talking before we sort of came on air about sort of, you know, what some people sort of understand and don't understand within the industry. Um, and for me, you know, you, you would never forward stuff on. You know, that has, those, those replies to inquiries have to be interpreted. They have to be legalised and then sent to the yeah. buyer's lawyer. Um, you know, sending something on, I can only think of one word, and that's probably laziness, isn't it? You know, um, or, or lack of understanding. You know, I've had these answers in, I'll send them on. And there could be something in there that completely compromises your client in a number of different ways, not just their information, but what they're saying. There could be numerous, you know, repercussions from that. Peter, I'm wondering, actually, because, um, you know, and I sort of made the slight sort of, you know, um, thing at the beginning about Thought Leader, but you are, because you do have that, uh, to my mind anyway, a pretty unique perspective in terms of you spent, you, you know, you spent so long properly sort of in the technology industry that you, uh, you know, you can very clearly see how it applies and how it works to what the rest of us do. So I'm wondering, Peter, just as a matter of interest, really, um, whether you are prepared to, if any firms want to talk to you afterwards about this or about your thoughts, um, you know, uh, uh, whether that, that's conversations you're prepared to have with people. <laughs> um, I don't believe that sharing is caring, but... I think the thing is, if you're going to take people, if you're going to take people with yeah. you, no, you're right. No, you're right. No, you're absolutely right. No, I do have people coming up to me and saying, oh, can you tell me how you do this? I'm like, no, no. but no, but I, no, but um, absolutely. I mean, certainly in terms of ideas, I mean, I'm more than happy to share ideas. And, and I do this. I'm a columnist on Property Industry Eye and I will always yeah. share ideas on that with that. And, and, and our philosophy is absolutely the case. I think I'm more than happy to have a conversation with people to say, OK, this is what you need to be doing. OK. I think first things first, in terms of our philosophy, the first thing you need to do is you need to get the information out of people's heads and into systems. That's the key that you need to be doing. And that's one thing we're doing. And I'm always happy to share ideas um, with that and, and the way to do it. The problem that we've got is the technology platforms that are out there today don't really support this kind of thinking. Um, I think we need to move people away from thinking, I need to remember everything. OK, yeah. I need um, it's a terrible, terrible mistake that people make, but they can't work out. You know, our, our favorite topic is talk about inquiries. That's why it's a, it's a massive. I always call it the black hole of conveyancing. Um, it's our favorite topic. You've got to codify this. You've got to structure it. You've got to put it to the clients. And I'm more than happy to explain to people, you know, the idea of hazards. OK, we have a hazard area in our system. OK, because what we have, every case is different, but everyone has hazards. So you must codify that. Break it down, say, what are the problems with this particular case, but store that information. Don't care how you do it, but do that, you know, and, and I'm more than happy to talk to people about this philosophy of saying, have it so that it's on a system so that if you need to get hit by a bus, or more importantly, if someone else can give answers on your behalf, it's going to take the pressure off on the lawyer. You can only reduce pressure on lawyers by taking information out of their heads and putting it into a codified system. The other thing you have to do is you need to stick more and more information in a place where clients can get access to it because all the time we're taking all this information from clients we're interpreting it we're translating it we're doing this we're doing that we're missing it we're making mistakes with it okay yeah. if you let the client drive the self-service as i said i was in service and one of the keys is self-service okay and people love this stuff don't get me wrong they love it people love using our portal oh great i can go on to so what you need to do is get the clients to do more of the work themselves because they want to 
Mm. How many times do I, when I talk to people, what can I do to help? I had someone yesterday, Friday, she said to me, I've even offered, uh, offered to help draft the draft for you. I'm like, yeah, that's not so helpful. But <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, brilliant, I'm brilliant at drafting. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. So it's like, but start thinking that way. Start thinking about how can you get information out of people's heads and into a system, not onto a bit of paper, not onto a manual checklist, not onto a post-it note. And this is what you've got to be doing. The challenge for most lawyers, unfortunately, the vast majority of those that I speak to don't have case management systems. They don't. I don't buy this argument that people have embraced tech since COVID-19. Not one little bit, okay? Um, the other thing is, do if they do have a case management system, either they don't buy enough licenses for it so that everyone can use it, okay, which is very common. Um, the other one is, or they don't use it at all. Yes. <laughs> it's... I do um, some of the things, you know, do some consultancy going into firms and looking at systems and what they do. And as I say, and this is from a, it's just from a risk perspective, not, yeah. not from a tech perspective. I can do bold and italic. I know my limitations <laughs> quite clearly. But what I can do is go into, a, and go into a firm, and I've done this on more than one occasion, and I've said, you know, biggest risk, one of the biggest risks, missing your OS1. Very, very obvious, a huge risk. Firm had got a case management system. I sat with their members of staff individually and said, right, where do you put, how do you record your OS1 expiry day? And they all looked at me and went, well, we don't. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you've yeah. got a system. You've got a case management system. Surely, surely that's enough. But so, Stu, um, probably we ought to bring this brilliantly fan fascinating chat with Peter to an end. We could be here all morning. Is there anything else uh, in particular that you... Um, would like to ask Peter? No, I mean, I, I just find it sort of refreshing to, to, to sort of chat with somebody that understands, you know, the, the troubles that we have as a law firm and, you know, the, the significant sort of pressure that surrounds risk and, and cyber fraud and everything else. And it's, it's refreshing to talk about this because I don't think the wider audience, you know, clients, the public, they really understand some of the, you know, the issues that affect the profession. Um, and it's refreshing to speak to somebody else at another firm. You could argue it's my competition, but I would, you know, I, I really enjoy speaking to Peter because you know, it's refreshing to hear, you know, law firms looking to embrace change, looking to embrace technology. And I think it really is that type of practice that's only going to drive, you know, drive the profession forward in general. And it really is a worry at the moment that the lack of firms out there that, you know, as Peter says, don't even have a case management system. I could not dream of running this practice with that one how i would be able to monitor the volume of information that comes through our door and out the back door without a case management system would just be i couldn't sleep you know i could not sleep at night um and if you haven't got practices and foundations how you're going to process certain things like os1 you know i mean that's just a you would have thought, wouldn't you? That's the most basic thing ever. But yeah. you know, how do you how do you monitor those if, if you're dealing with thousands of them? It's still one um, of the biggest sources of negligence claims against conveyance in firms. It's extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary. But it, it just demonstrates the lack of knowledge, doesn't it? Well, we don't record them. What? You know, how could you even think? You know, <laughs> know. what happens when it expires? Yeah. You know, um, what does that mean? What could happen? What would the risk be? Um, you know, I don't want to sound lectury now, like you, Lorraine, but yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks for that, Stu. <laughs> but um, you know, but, but, but Peter's, you know, again, it's it risk, isn't it? Is, is the the probably the most fashionable word now? I think as as lawyers, we all talk about, um, and it's sort of evaluating the risk and, and having a common sense attitude towards it as well as refreshing. Thank well, thanks, Peter, so much. I'm you know genuinely thrilled that you've come to talk to us, and I have to say. I suspect that we might be inviting you back and talking to you about uh, something else. As I say, the digital signatures was particularly fascinating. But I think, to be frank, you've got a lot to, you know, a lot to uh, to teach a lot of people in the profession, quite frankly. So it's absolutely delightful to have you on Conveyancing Matters. So thanks ever so much for coming. Take care. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Take bye. Care, Peter. Bye. bye, guys. <laughs>